uh, welcome here in this session on string theory and quantum gravity that I have been organizing together with uh, Samson Shadashvili. Uh, today we have three excellent speakers and we're very pleased to hear their talks about exciting topics and the developments going on in this field. And the first speaker will be Miranda Cheng uh, from the University of Amsterdam and from uh, Taipei University in Taiwan. And she's going to tell us about uh, developments in, in three manifold uh, invariants and the connection uh, with uh, 3D quantum field theory. So, uh, Miranda, uh, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes. Um, I assume so. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, at this wonderful event. And thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'll speak about uh, three manifold invariants from three dimensional quantum field theories. Um, so this is, uh, well, now I'm trying to click. Okay. Um, this is based on uh, some ongoing series of works with uh, a fantastic group of collaborators, including Boris Feigen, Sergei Bukov, Sarah Harrison and uh, PhD students and postdocs, including uh, Sung Bong Chun from Rutgers, uh, Joanna Coleman in Amsterdam, and Francesca Ferrari in CISA, David Passaro and uh, Gabriele Scroy, who are my uh, grad students. And um, so um, here today, we will talk about uh, the properties of a specific uh, three manifold invariants that I'll call uh, Z hat. So the ideas and the construction mostly come, uh, come from uh, physics uh, in, uh, in particular from M theory and three dimensional quantum field theory. And then it has direct um, application in topology. And uh, we will also use a lot of tools from number theory to study its property. And finally, it dis displays an interesting connection to um, algebra, and in particular, a uh, certain type of uh, vertex operator algebra. So um, let's talk about uh, uh, topological invariance of three manifolds first. A key goal in low dimensional topology is to construct powerful topological invariants that can distinguish topologically inequivalent three manifolds. So there are distinct, distinct ways to construct topological invariants on manifolds using physical ideas. For instance, we can uh, do so by defining a topological quantum field theory or some supersymmetric sector of uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory on the manifold themselves, or by considering some auxiliary uh, field theories. And uh, in this talk, we will mainly be taking the second point of view. Uh, but first, there's one familiar uh, um, uh, 3D, three, uh, three manifold invariants that's come from the first point of view. Namely, there is simply the partition functions of the topological field theory, which is the familiar chain Simon theory defined on the manifold itself. Okay, so the, it gives what's called the witten rushdegin to arrive invariance up to some normalization. And then, uh, so it, it's a function that's defined on the uh, integers. And what is this integer? This is called the level or the effective level, in fact, of the Chern Simons uh, theory. And then, uh, so given the three manifold and given such a level, we can compute the partition function and the resulting number will be a topological invariant, okay? So in this talk, we will, at least in the initial part of the talk, we will mostly focus on the gauge group of SU2. But then the question is, well, okay, it's a little awkward to have a function that de defines on you know discrete uh, sets, namely the integers, then we do something better. And in particular, we can contrast the situation to a very analogous situation of uh, not uh, invariance. So for not uh, the trans-Simons partition function can be extended to what's called the Jones polynomial, which is a function that's defined on the unit disk. 
Well, and then moreover, it can be categorified. In other words, well, we can associate a vector space K of n to each uh, Q power in such a Jones polynomial. And then this categorification will give us much more powerful topological invariants. So a natural question is then, how do we uh, categorify the Chen Simons partition function, function now for not for knots, but for closed three manifolds? Well, first, is there a Q series invariant that uh, plays an analogous role as the Jones polynomial? That will be the first step. So this is the step that we will uh, address uh, in the, we'll be discussing this talk. So indeed, uh, we will be studying such a candidate. Okay, so um, what is this uh, uh, um, uh, topological invariance that extends the Chen Simons? Well, we will say that it arises from a three dimensional uh, uh, quantum field theory, which does not live on the three manifold. However, it's determined, the theory itself is determined by the internal three manifold M3 for which we're computing the topological invariance. So uh, the string theoretic setup is the following. Well, we consider M5 brain theory uh, on the uh, six dimensional manifold of a cigar times the time and then this uh, three dimensional manifold. And this can be embedded in the whole M theory. And this guy becomes a part of the top knot space time. And then on the one hand, we have this internal manifold M3, uh, M3 and its topological properties will uh, in, be encoded in this uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory. So uh, in particular, we will be considering the supersymmetric partition function, which will give us a topological invariant of the hidden three manifold. To be more precise, well, we will consider a Hilbert space, the Hilbert space of such a theory on this uh, background. But notice that the space time, because it has a cigar factor, so it's non compact so we need to specify the supersymmetric boundary condition of this uh, uh, 3D uh, QFT. And this boundary condition, in this case, will correspond on the three manifold side to the abelian SU2 flat connections. Okay, once you have chosen your supersymmetric super symmetry preserving boundary condition, you can define your Hilbert space that's uh, naturally bigraded by the U1 times U1 symmetry of uh, the top knot. So using this bi-graded Hilbert space, you can construct the, uh, the uh, partition function counting the BPS states as in this way, okay, given by the dimension, graded dimension of this Hilbert space. Or in the passing integral uh, formalism, you can uh, think about it as, you know, the result of doing a path integral with the appropriate things turn on on this background, okay? The cigar times the time circle. And in this way, this tau, okay, tau variable will be uh, simply the complex structure of your boundary torus, okay, on which you define your boundary condition. So the dictionary quickly. So M3 is the internal three-dimensional manifold that determines the QFT, okay? And this label B will be labeling a specific choice of the supersymmetry preserving boundary conditions of this 3D uh, QFT, T of M3. And this tau variable, you can think about it geometrically as a complex structure of your boundary torus or as in the Hamiltonian formula, then the, 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 your grading parameter. Okay, so such a supersymmetry uh, partition function is what's gonna be our um, uh, topological invariant. And uh, recall that uh, we have actually a set of topological invariants for M3, and the set is labeled by the boundary conditions, or you know, equivalently the um, abelian uh, uh, SU2 flat connections on M3. Okay. 
So uh, there are some heuristic reason to expect that this function will have some nice property when we transform the uh, complex structure tau in a way that's familiar in modular forms and so on by SL2Z. Well, because the boundary condition specifies a way that, that the bulk three-dimensional theory couples to uh, 2D uh, CFT. So then a the question is how much of this modularity property of the familiar, um, familiar property of the 2D CFT actually uh, re gets retained in this coupled system? And obviously, right, uh, the answer should depend on the nature of this bulk theory. So indeed, if, we, if the bulk theory is trivial, then all the degrees of freedom comes from the boundary CFT. Then uh, we expect, extending the usual law on CFT, that uh, the partition function is going to be modular. Okay, we'll transform like a modular form, uh, which we will uh, uh, introduce later. Well, if it's somehow non-trivial, but not completely non-trivial, we also expect some vestiges of modularity property. And if it's extremely non-trivial, not even gapped and so on, then uh, it's probably more subtle. So we, today we will uh, be working in this sweet spot in the middle where it's tractable, but also new and non-trivial. Okay. So, so far for the physical definition of this invariant. So in principle, we should then be able to compute this invariant via localization techniques developed uh, to study uh, SQFTs in various uh, situations. However, there are still many things. In fact, we do not know about the M5 brain theories. And as a result about the 3D theory, bulk theory. So as a result, we can actually only compute using these physical ways um, only for a very limited class of three minute votes, for instance, for lens basis. But what, what else can we do if we really want to study you know, uh, or compute this uh, invariance for more general three minute votes? Well, Instead, using the expected relation between this new invariance and the old invariance, namely the Trent-Simons partition function, and inspired by how the localization works, a mathematical definition has been proposed for a special family of M3. Well, technically, they're called the weakly negative or negative plumb three manifolds. So plumb three manifolds um, are uh, some you know special family of uh, three manifolds, closed three manifolds, and um, in particular, it includes uh, all the cipher manifolds, but infinitely more. Um, so they have many nice properties to make them especially tractable. Also in this context, so we're working from now on under the assumption that the following conjecture is true, namely the mathematical and physical definition yield the same answer whenever they're both applicable. Okay, and of course it will be very interesting to extend this mathematical definition and it has been done and is also one of the, our goals, but uh, I won't have time to go into that today. Today I'm going just going to work with, you know, the, this uh, plot manifold context. So turning this around, the conjecture that the mathematical definition captures the physical answer gives us a useful tool to study the properties of the supersymmetric field theory. And uh, through this, the properties of the 3D theory and the original five brain theory. So that's part of the physical in, uh, motivation. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. And then let me, and then for the second part, uh, I will start discussing the properties uh, of this function. So um, our work uh, is based on two uh, main conjectures that would, we would like to uh, establish. So the first conjecture is on the modular property of this function. In particular, uh, we believe that this uh, topological invariant is a so-called quantum modular form of some kind. 
Okay, and the first is that, uh, and the se sorry, the second conjecture is, is in a different direction, namely that uh, for many M3s, I'll be more specific later if I've got time, uh, for many M3s, then there is a vertex operator algebra, okay, determined by the uh, three manifold, such that uh, this uh, supersymmetric partition function is basically it's uh, a character of it. Okay, so uh, before we go into the technical details, uh, let's think about uh, what these conjectures, if true, will be telling us. So first, if we establish the first conjecture, we establish the novel type of modified modular properties that appear in this uh, special three-dimensional context, generalizing you know, the modular properties we're familiar with in the context of two-dimensional conflict field theories. And uh, in, the sec in terms of the second conjecture, well, if you know, we, have a, we can construct a VOA uh, a court, uh, given a, given a three-dimensional manifold, then uh, such that you know, it produces characters that are basically the same as partition function, then we establish that th this, there's a vertex algebra symmetry of um, the supersymmetric sector of the 3D uh, QFT. Okay, so uh, turning it around, it would also be very interesting uh, mathematically to establish these conjectures. So the first, uh, the first conjecture is interesting because quantum module form is some rather, you know, uh, new concept, and it will be very interesting to, um, to, to, to have more insight about why such a property is natural by providing, you know, natural examples coming from physics and topology. And the second, because, well, the type of vertex operator algebras we encounter are also extremely interesting from a VOA point of view. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So, okay, what's our current strategy? Our strategy is to extend and exploit the mathematical definition for this uh, topological invariance and uh, to make progress in, in establishing these conjectures. That's the current strategy. And in the future, we of course would like to go back to the first conjecture, namely establishing that indeed it's the same answer that physics uh, is supposed to get. So to explain the first conjecture, I should tell you a bit, uh, at least in spirit, what quantum module forms are. So let's go back to what module forms are. So the most simplest way in my mind to think about such things is that it's a function uh, of three uh, of two dimensional lattices, okay, that transforms well under a rescaling and a rotation of the lattice in this way, given in terms of this uh, formula. So mu can be a complex number. So when it's a phase, it represents a rotation because I identify R2 with C. Okay, so uh, using this and of course the SO2Z equivalence of the chosen generators of two dimensional lattices, we can then put one of the generators to be one and the other we call it tau, which is a, a, a number in the upper half plane and treat this function on the 2D lattices as a holomorphic function defined on the upper half plane. And this rescaling symmetry will then look like the following. Here I define what's called a slash operator, but basically it just means this rescaling symmetry. Okay, so the upper half plane has natural boundary. Well, one obvious one is I infinity, right? When the when the uh, lattice becomes degenerate. And I infinity gets mapped to uh, rational numbers, all the rational numbers uh, under SO2Z. In fact, SO2Z acts transitively among them. So they correspond to the natural boundary of the upper half plane. So then it's interesting and natural to study the 
boundary behavior of uh, function defined on the upper half plane. So in particular, by taking the limits carefully, be aware of the singularities and so on. In particular, if F is a modular form, as we defined in the previous slide, then we see that we can uh, take the limits, it's called the radial limit, because in the Q plane, if we take the exponential, then it's approaching the root of unity when tau is approaching a rational number, right? So if f is a module form, then uh, the, this radial limit function uh, behaves in such a way that the co-cycle vanishes, right? Basically, the modular symmetry gets translated into this symmetry, modular symmetry of the function defined on the rational numbers. And this vanishing of the co-cycle, this is what we would like to extend. So, um, a definition of quantum modular form in uh, is, is, is given, well, one version of the definition is given by Don Seguier in 2010. It says that we call this function defined on a rational number to be quantum modular of certain way, just like in the modular form case. If the co-cycle doesn't have to vanish, but it has to have some analytic or continuity property, okay? So one trivial example would be the module form because the co-cycle would vanish. And the second class of examples are all, yeah, includes all the modular, uh, mock module forms, if you know what they are. If you don't know what they are, they're something that's almost modular but needs a non-holomorphic uh, correction uh, in order to be completely modular. And there's also some even more interesting and new examples such as this, strange function of Kosevich. Um, it's defined as formally as this infinite sum. And as you could say, this is only defined on roots of unity, right? Otherwise the sum is just never ending. Okay, so, uh, but however, when you take the co-cycle of this function that only is only defined on the uh, roots of unity, it has miraculously all of a sudden some uh, continuity property. So that's why it qualifies as a uh, quantum modular form defined in this way. Okay, so that's the sort of the uh, protagonist of this first conjecture. So now we would like to give some interpretations also of these conjectures. So why this topological invariance have to be quantum modular forms or of some kind? Why do we expect even in the first place such things to be true, except for you know, the vague argument, heuristic argument I gave you, namely that there is a boundary torus and there is a CFT living on it. And we just hope that you know, the bulk theory doesn't mess up that modularity on the boundary too much. But in fact, we can say something more precise about it, okay? And this is, uh, and here the key fact is that this topological invariants are closely related to the old topological invariants, namely the trans-Simons partition function. So in order to recover from the new invariants, the old invariants, you have to do two things. So first of all, Recall that you have a set of invariants labeled by uh, the permissive, uh, permissible um, boundary conditions. And somehow you have to combine all these new set of new invariants in the well-defined and uh, appropriate way. So, the, and, but you still afterwards get the function of tau. And after that, you have to take the radial limit by taking tau to one of the irrational number given by one over k. Recall that k is the level of the trans Simons. So then you get from the uh, new to the old invariant. So now, okay, thank you very much for the reminder. So now, once you have this relation and you consider the uh, S transformation of tau, okay? So then you get like one over tau, tau gets related to the minus, uh, one over K gets rela related to minus K and then there are some residual terms. 
And if you remember the definition of a quantum modular forms, it says like when you take things to you know the root of unity, and what's left over, namely the co-cycle, should be analytic. So that says that the dot 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 is analytic. So in the transcendence context, okay, if you take the classical large uh, level limit, then this above relation has the natural interpretation in terms of resurgence analysis of, in fact, complex transcendence of complex gauge group, SO2C in this case. So this first term has the interpretation of the center point contribution and the dot, 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 the cosycro piece will give you the perturbative series. So you can think about then the relation between the new and the old invariants as somehow like doing the trans series expansion to go to transcendence and doing the borrower summation to go to the Z hat in some sense. So that's how one way to understand why quantum modular form should be a natural uh, property um, in this context. So uh, how about uh, vertex operator algebra? So in fact, I should say that so far, we mainly encountered uh, log VOAs, well, which are irrational vertex operator algebras underlying the so-called logarithmic conformal field theories, which are necessary uh, to describe a wide variety of physical phenomena, for instance, percolation in systems of French disorders and whatnot. Um, so our conjecture actually suggests that such an algebra acts on the BPS states for all the super sym symmetry preserving boundary conditions. Okay, so you only ha need to like have some one or one VOA for you know one bulk theory independent of the uh, boundary condition chosen. So uh, right now we do not have an exact construction of these algebras from you know, the 3D QFD point of view. And this is gonna be, of course, an interesting uh, problem to look at. And maybe one can look at, well, actually people have looked at a specific, extremely simple uh, toy examples, um, but uh, not you know, this, the log VOAs that we are looking at here is still an open uh, uh, problem. So, uh, so those are the two main conjectures and I won't bore you with the details, but uh, we've been working very hard and also other teams to uh, collect, uh, you know, uh, new insights and, 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 and new evidence for uh, these conjectures and make co new conjectures as we go along. So I'll just summarize by saying that there's still lots of work to be done before we can understand this new topological invariance for three manifolds for the most general three manifolds in particular. But we have already encountered a lot of new mathematics and get an important hints about physics uh, along the way. So um, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice uh, and clear lecture. Um, so are there questions from the audience? Yes, I have one question here. Go ahead. Hi, hi Miranda. Uh, I, I have a very basic question about this uh, modularity. Um, yeah, why is it expected? Because I, I mean, I understand the context of AVS Three CFT two, where you sum over geometries, and therefore you mm -hmm, you, don't, you don't the, you don't decide how you contract which cycle contracts on the torus, for example. The fairy tale business, yeah. But here it seems that you started from an actual field theory in a fixed background that just asymptotes to a to a torus. So so why do you expect modular invariance here? So. Well, uh, first, uh, the modular invariance is uh, too big a word. Instead, what we get is a vector value module forms, which transform like a different Z hat corresponding to different boundary conditions among each other. That's the best case. So in some sense, it's not modular invariance for the reason that might be relevant, that, that might be close to your comment. And, uh, and second, so we don't know exactly why 
um, so that's the fun part, right? Before you started out, you don't know exactly what type of traces of leftover uh, modularity properties you would encounter. You think that there should be some, you know, leftover thing. Also from the VOA point of view, right? These are irrational VOAs. So since they're not rational, then Drew theorem doesn't work and, uh, and uh, you know, the linear formula doesn't work and so on. So you don't, un you don't a priori know what, what the character, what kind of properties the characters will have. They're probably not modular forms, but they're probably some cousin of it. So you just go and look at it. And then indeed, uh, so uh, this new uh, concept of quantum modular forms that's proposed by uh, Don Zagir seem to be just, you know, the right tools to look at it. And then we also notice that it fits very nicely from the researcher's point of view. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, thank you. I think we... Any other questions? I think, uh, well, I have one question actually. You mentioned something about the vertex separator algebras. I mean, this is something we know well for the Trin Simons theories, but in this case, I mean, what do you expect kind of, what kind of algebras do you expect to get here? So, I mean, we observe that um, we get all kinds of different types of logarithmic vertex, op uh, vertex algebras. So what does that mean? That means like, uh, you know, if you look at how the characters transform itself, you see like bare factors of tau that's logarithmic, right? That's a log of Q appearing everywhere. And then, or, you know, if you look at uh, log C CFDs, which are the, you know, left to right version of the Tarot algebra, then uh, you see indeed also logarithmic uh, uh, factors in the, in the divergences in the correlator. So that's, that seems to be the type that we'll get, that we get so far, but we also know that this is an artifact Okay, um, of the fact that we're choosing this uh, specific, uh, sp well, this rather manageable type of uh, three manifolds to study, which are the so-called plump manifolds. And in fact, on general grounds, um, we don't expect such nice algebras to appear if the three manifold is hyperbolic, for instance, then uh, we expect like the conformal weight will be in general complex and so on and so forth. Okay. So, but okay. I mean, in, 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 that's why conjecture two is like, so sort of um, loosely formulated because the guess is the conjecture is that for all three manifold, there should be some kind of vertex operator algebra, but I mean, Probably for most of the three manifolds, the vertex operator algebras won't be, won't be you know the the types that we have seen before. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, very much. Uh, in view of the time, let's thank Miranda again and for a nice talk. And we go to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so the next speaker will be Alex Berlin. Uh, he's here from CERN and Geneva. Uh, he uh, has been working uh, on a topic actually uh, with, with a speaker that we originally invited. Actually, was very happy that he could fill in. So it's going to be about uh, the, the way that statistical physics sort of plays a role now in quantum gravity. Uh, it's an exciting field with many things going on. So I'm looking forward to this presentation. So Alex, uh, please uh, go ahead. Great. Well, let me start by thanking the, the organizers of this really amazing conference um, and also thanking Eric and Samson uh, for the nice introduction and for setting up uh, this, this wonderful thematic session. So, so as Eric said, um, you may have noticed I'm not Jan de Boer, um, but uh, he had a last minute conflict, so I'm very ha happy to be able to fill in for him and I'll tell you about the, the work that we've been doing. So th this talk today is going to be based uh, on work that appeared over the last year. Um, as well as three papers that I hope will appear in the next couple of weeks. And I should acknowledge uh, all my amazing collaborators. So of course, uh, Jan and Praj Prajal Nayak and Julian Sonner who are uh, in, at the University of Geneva and Tarek Anus and Diego Liska who are at the University of Amsterdam. Great, so let's get started. My talk today is gonna be about the ADS-CFT correspondence. 
uh, which is a duality between certain strongly coupled conformal field theories with a large number of local degrees of freedom um, and theories of quantum gravity in anti de Sitter space. And I think it's important to emphasize that, that both sides uh, of this duality are complicated. The left-hand side is complicated because it's a strongly interacting uh, conformal field theory, so it's you know, a very chaotic quantum many-body system. The right-hand side, you might argue, is even more complicated because it's a theory of quantum gravity, um, and we don't really know what quantum gravity is. Um, so it's complicated. However, um, this theory of quantum gravity admits a low-energy effective um, description in terms of semi-classical general relativity or supergravity. Okay, so the path integral of the theory of quantum gravity is well approximated in some cases uh, by, sim by simply the semi-classical path integral of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Okay, and this is a much simpler theory, um, and so we can learn a lot from it. So what are the types of things that we would like to be able to do? One thing that we would like to be able to do is solve for the spectrum of the conformal field theory. Say solve for the spectrum of n equals to four super yang mills at large n and strong coupling. And we know that the spectrum of a, of a CFT when placed on a sphere um, is discrete. So the spectrum is going to uh, be basically the, the density of states is just going to be a sum over um, Kronecker deltas supported at the energy at the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And just by sort of random matrix universality, um, because this is a chaotic system, it's going to be an extremely complicated spectrum, which you can think about as this barcode here. Okay. And one thing that we would like to do is be able to solve for the individual eigenvalues. Of course, that's extremely difficult. And in fact, even just counting the number of eigenvalues that you have in a particular band is extremely difficult. The other types of things that we would like to be able to do is compute correlation functions of certain operators, for example, finite temperature correlation functions, um, say two-point functions, for example. Um, and there's, again, a nice and um, sort of universal way to encode the, the operator dynamics um, in, in quantum chaotic many body system. And that's known as the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis um, as postulated by Deutsch and Srednicki, uh, which says that um, matrix elements of simple operators have a sort of universal structure in the chaotic quantum many body systems. Uh, they have a universal structure in that there's a diagonal piece, um, which is proportional to a smooth function which is given by the microcanonical expectation value of this operator O. And then there's an off-diagonal piece, which is exponentially suppressed in the entropy, uh, times another function, G, which is related to basically the Fourier transform of the microcanonical two-point function. Uh, and then there's some, um, there's some um, elements here, Rij, which are erratic numbers that oscillate um, in a crazy fashion. And for many practical purposes, you can treat them as random variables with a Gaussian distribution. OK, but again, just from the conformal field theory itself, even extracting these smooth functions here, uh, the microcanonical one and two-point functions, is extremely complicated. And this is where gravity kicks in, is that there's a simple way to do this. Um, you can look for a black hole solution in asymptotically anti de Sitter space. And then, then the Bekenstein-Hawking um, formula for black hole entropy will tell you that the density of states is given by the uh, area of the horizon over 4G Newton. Similarly, once you have the black hole background, you can start computing few point correlation functions of the perturbative fields on this background, say one and two point functions. And what this will give access, what this will give access to is these smooth functions, F and G, um, uh, which are smooth functions of the energy of the mean energy and energy difference. Okay, so, so what gravity does is it gives us, uh, uh, it gives us a simple tool to access the, these functions. Okay, um, so this is, just black hole thermodynamics applied to ADS CFT. Um, and so the way you should think about it is that, you know, semi classical GR gives us information about this strongly coupled CFT uh, and it's, it's high energy dyna dynamics, but it's not microscopic information. It's coarse grain or thermodynamic information. We get access to these smooth functions. Okay. And the reason I'm putting um, just in quotation marks is that this is already quite a bit more of what you might expect of a low energy effective field theory, of a vanilla low energy effective field theory. A vanilla low energy effective field theory you would think, you know, is efficient at computing uh, few point correlation functions on a fixed frozen ADS background. Um, here we're accessing high energy dynamics, although we're only accessing it in a coarse grained way. And in, in particular, it's important to emphasize that, you know, at this stage, semi-classical DR does not have access to, to the microscopics. It cannot access this 
barcode uh, or these erratic numbers that appear in ETH. Okay, does not have access to them. Or does it? And my talk today is going to be about trying to understand exactly how much information the semi-classical path integral of gravity has access to. Okay, and in fact, in the last few years, there's been really exciting developments on this topic. And what we've realized is that the semi-classical path integral is actually much more efficient uh, than what we previously thought. And encode, it encodes a lot more information, but it does it through wormholes, through wormhole geometries. Um, so one quantity that is nice to compute and that people working on random matrix theory and quantum chaos like to consider is the so-called spectral form factor, which is um, just the square of the uh, thermal partition function analytically continued to Lorentz in time. Um, and so it looks just like the square of a partition function, but it has this oscillating piece here that depends on the energy difference. And if you plot this function for, you know, say a chaotic spin chain, what it'll look like is the following. It'll start with add some value and then it'll decrease in time uh, because of um, the, the, these phases here. Um, and then at late times, it, when, once the signal is very, very small, it'll start to have some crazy erratic oscillations. Uh, but there's a general pattern in these oscillations is that there's going to be a linearly increasing ramp and then a plateau. Okay, and in particular, this ramp here um, is really related to the fact that uh, nearby eigenvalues want to repel um, in a chaotic system. And what there's been beautiful work by Satchenker and Stanford um, a, a few years ago that showed that actually this ramp here can be encoded um, semi-classically by gravity. And it's in terms of a wormhole geometry that connects two boundaries. Okay, and this is best understood in, in examples of 2D graphics. Okay. And I should really emphasize here that this is now very much fine-grained information that's sensitive to the discrete nature of black hole, uh, of black hole microstates. Okay, so it's much more fine-grained information than what we had before. Uh, it's still not everything because we cannot get these wiggles, these red wiggles, um, but we get some information about statistical correlations of black hole microstates and the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and I should say that this is not unrelated to the progress on reproducing a unitary page curve for the black hole evaporation. Um, and unfortunately, I had to miss the talk by Juan earlier, but I'm sure he talked about replica wormholes, uh, which are similar objects to these um, in quite some detail. Okay, so what we've learned is that uh, if you take into account wormhole geometry, you, you have access to a lot more physics than what you had previously thought. However, there's a price to pay and this is known as the factorization puzzle. And in fact, before realizing wormholes were useful, we were very confused about wormholes. And this is a puzzle that was brought forward, like I said, many years ago by Miles and Maldacena. And the puzzle is the following. Let's compute the product of partition functions for two CFTs on disconnected manifolds. And let's then try to ask how we can reproduce that from gravity. Uh, so in ADS CFT, when you um, compute a partition function, you're asked to look for all geometries that, that fill in the boundary um, geometry in some way. So if we have, say, two boundary circles, well, what we can do is we can fill each of them independently by something that will have the topology of a disk. Um, but there's, uh, there's going to be other fillings that connect the two boundaries. And so when we go and compute um, this square of partition functions in gravity, we're going to get a first piece, which is just going to be f of beta 1 times f of beta 2, plus a second function that is going to come from this wormhole. And this total answer cannot be written as a direct and factorized product of two functions f twiddle. But obviously, um, if you compute just the square of partition functions on two disconnected manifolds in a CFT, that will just obviously factorize. OK, so there seems to be a mismatch between what you can compute uh, in the CFT and what the gravitational theory gives you. And what I'd like to do in this talk today is um, sort of present a framework that can try to explain this and explain what gravity has access to and how to think about the factorization puzzle. Um, and I should say that a lot of the words I've said before, really, when I'm talking about ETH uh, and the spectrum and so on, are really applied best to quantum mechanics. And we have a conformal field theory. And the dynamical data of a conformal field theory is given in terms of the scaling dimensions of local operators. This is the spectrum. Um, and then OPE coefficients, which you can think of as couplings or also matrix elements between the different operators. And so this is really related to operator statistics, and it's what I'm going to be talking about today. Good. So um, we proposed a conjecture um, with Jan um, to explain all of this, known as the OPE randomness hypothesis. 
Um, and the conjecture is the following, is that in chaotic conformal field theories, if you consider any OPE coefficient that involves an operator whose scaling dimension is becoming very, very large in the thermodynamic limit, then that these OPE coefficients uh, should be given by random variables with the leading order, to leading approximation a Gaussian distribution. Okay, and it's important to note that um, this these types of OPE coefficients here with two heavy operators uh, through the state operator correspondence that you have in a conformal field theory. This is nothing else than the expectation value of a light operator in two uh, energy eigenstates in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, which is what the ETH ANSAS controls. So in some sense, uh, the OP randomness hypothesis is a generalization of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis when applied to chaotic conformal field theories. So this is a conjecture. Uh, and then the gravitational interpretation of this is that semi-classical gravity uh, treats these variables uh, only statistically in that uh, it can never um, resolve the individual erratic numbers uh, that's the microscopics, but what it can do is extract the moments of these statistical distributions. But by only keeping the moments, it makes an error. And this error is what the wormhole is, and it explains the lack of factorization. Okay, so let me give an example of this, and it's going to be um, an example for two-dimensional conformal field theories, and a particular wormhole geometry that was considered by Maus and Baltasena, which is called the genus 2 wormhole. So let's consider an OPE coefficient with three heavy operators. Um, and so the OP randomness hypothesis tells us that this should be some random variable, R, I, J, K. Note that unlike for the ETH, there's no diagonal piece here. Uh, time some function, um, which encodes the variance of this, of this random variable here. And it turns out that because of modular invariance of the genus 2 partition function that I'll talk about in a second, uh, this function here is fixed. And it was worked out in, in this paper here. So what is a genus 2 partition function? Well, it's kind of like uh, a thermal partition function, although instead of summing over just energy eigenstates, you sum over three uh, triplets of energy eigenstates uh, weighted by uh, some sort of effective temperature, which labels the moduli of the surface. Here I've picked in a slice where there's a single moduli. Um, and it's weighted by the OPE coefficient squared. So it's a little bit like a thermal partition function, but with three energy eigenstates, and it's weighted by the OPE coefficients. OK, um, and what I want to do now is try to compute the square of this partition function, um, but not microscopically, using this OP randomness hy hypothesis. OK, I, I cannot compute it microscopically anyway. So what would you do? Well, you're going to introduce, you know, the square of this is going to have four OP coefficients contracted in a particular way with indices, and we're going to be summing over six states. And since these, these OP coefficients are uh, Gaussian random variables, you can essentially do wick contractions. Uh, so there's an obvious weak contraction, which is just contracting the two, the two OPE coefficients that are um, contracted by the, the sum over indices here. Um, and that gives you a first contribution, which when you work out what the particular function f is and you use entropy factors, you get this particular uh, dependence here, where c is the central charge of the CFT. But there's also another weak contraction where you contract the different OPE coefficients. It's kind of like a connected component. And if you work out all the factors, it gives you essentially one or some order one function that is not exponentially large in the central charge. And now you can ask, how does that match with what you would do in gravity? So in gravity, if you had two genus two surfaces, well, one thing that you could do is fill them up a little bit like Miranda was talking about in the previous talk. And you could do that on each of them independently. And this would be two disconnected handle body geometries. But there's also another geometry, which is known as the genus 2 wormhole, that connects these two surfaces. And when you look at the value of the on-shell action, well, this matches this. And this one also matches the on-shell action here, which vanishes. Okay, And I should emphasize that uh, I've picked a situation where the top and the bottom genus 2 surfaces have the same moduli. But if I had picked them with different moduli beta and beta prime, this term here would, would really be the term that um, is responsible for the lack of factorization. OK, so this seems to, so, so this is saying that if you just apply the OP randomness hypothesis here, you seem to nicely reproduce uh, a, a calculation that you can do in gravity. And you sort of explain the appearance of the wormhole. 
Um, but as I said, the OP randomness hypothesis is just a conjecture. In fact, even the ETH ANSATS has not been proven. It's been tested numerically on chaotic spin chains, uh, but there's no proof uh, that it applies uniformly. Um, but we'd like to gather some evidence for the OP randomness hypothesis. And, and the, the hard part from this is that, you know, it's a statement about OPE coefficients, and they don't really have natural counterparts in quantum mechanics. So if we're trying to even gain some insight from random matrix theory, uh, it's hard to directly apply it. Uh, so what we figured out we could do is we could um, take the square of an OPE coefficient, um, and we could uh, view it as a linear operator, but acting on a triple Hilbert space. Okay, so, so with, with, with say in some fixed basis, IJK here. Um, and um, so this is, this is a way to promote this object to a linear operator. Um, and then um, using an effective field theory of quantum chaos developed by Atlan and Sonner, um, we can try to ask what happens to this, to this type of operator when you do a kind of random matrix average, or, or you know, what happens to it based on universal features of ergodicity. And you can check that if you, by doing sort of a random matrix average, you'll promote this operator, it'll become kind of a random operator uh, acting on the tripled Hilbert space, and it'll give the right size of correlations uh, between the individual uh, CIJKs as predicted um, by the OP randomness hypothesis. So that's nice. Um, another thing to, to look at is non-Gaussianities. Um, as I said, these, these random variables have a distribution that uh, is to leading order a Gaussian distribution, but that's always just a leading order approximation, uh, even in ETH. So just consistency of the higher point correlation functions um, actually says that, that RJ are not Gaussian, but they're Gaussian to leading order, and there's higher moments uh, that are present, but the higher moments uh, are suppressed by additional factors of the entropy. So if you ask, for example, what is the relative weight of the case moment in these erratic numbers Rij, the relative weight of the kth moment is given by e to the minus k minus 1 over k times s. So they're further and further and further suppressed in the entropy the higher you go in k. And this was explained in a very nice paper by Fuani and Kirchan. So you could ask, well, can, can, what can we say about the higher moments of these other types of OPE coefficients that appear in the ORH? And um, just using, for 2D CFTs, just using crossing uh, symmetry of higher point correlation functions on the plane, and modular invariance at higher genus, we were actually able to, to, to constrain the, the higher moments of these, these uh, OPE coefficients as well. And if you consider OPE coefficients with three heavy operators, we were able to show that the case moment, certain cyclic contractions, uh, has a relative weight of e to the minus 5k minus 4 over 4k times s. And these particular integers here are not very important, but what's important is, they're, is that they're further and further suppressed uh, as you increase the moments. And similarly, if you look at uh, the case moment of the light, light, heavy OPE coefficient, um, you can also show that they're further, oh, there's an S missing here, sorry, that they're, they're further and further suppressed in the entropy as you go to the higher moments. Okay, so uh, let me just conclude and finish with some open question. So the OPE randomness hypothesis uh, is a conjecture that should apply to all chaotic conformal field theories. Um, and says that OPE coefficients um, can be treated statistically as random variables uh, with certain distributions. There's an interpretation of it in terms of semi-classical gravity, which says that you know, the semi-classical path integral can only resolve these statistical correlations. It can extract the moments um, of these statistical distributions, but it cannot extract the actual individual microscopic numbers. And this explains the appearance of wormholes and the lack of factorization. Uh, of course, there's no proof for the OPE randomness hypothesis, just like there's no proof uh, for the ETH. It would be great if the bootstrap could prove this one day, but we're still very far from that. Um, but we were able to show some evidence. Um, one piece of evidence comes from operator ergodicity and, and random matrix universality. Uh, and the other comes from constraints due to crossing and modular invariance on the size of the non-Gaussianities of the statistical numbers. And uh, maybe one comment is uh, what we should say about averaging and disorder averaging over Hamiltonians. So based on this factorization puzzle, also probably helped by the fact that in certain 2D models of gravity, for example, JT gravity, uh, its dual is actually given by a matrix model. So it has an, an explicit sum over couplings. And similarly for the SYK model, there's also an average over, over couplings that is performed. 
um, that perhaps averaging over Hamiltonians or averaging over couplings should be a fundamental aspect of the ADS-CFT correspondence. And, and based on what I told you today and my, my current view on this is my answer would be no. It still makes completely sense to talk about n equals to four super Yang mills at a fixed value of the Toth coupling at, and at fixed n, and that should be dual to type 2b string theory at fixed string lengths, at fixed alpha prime, and at fixed string coupling g strings. But here's how you should think about it. Um, let's just consider n random phases as a proxy for the spectral form factor or the genus 2 partition function or some more complicated formula. And we can compute the square of these random phases. There's going to be a diagonal piece where the phases cancel um, and just gives us a one. And then there's going to be an off diagonal piece where the phases don't cancel. And of course, both pieces are important to recover this factorized answer. Uh, and what we're saying is that semi-classical GR only has access to this diagonal piece. That's what the wormhole is. That's the, the smooth function, the variance or the higher moments. This is what we have access to. And we don't have access to this crazy erratic piece. But this crazy erratic piece is uh, important or crucial for restoring factorization. And so you can ask what types of gravitational objects would account for these. Uh, and you know, one would think that perhaps strings, grains, uh, or half wormholes, things that are, might not be present in the low energy effective description are responsible for these types of contributions. Of course, in some cases, you might be able to do an average. Um, and when you, can do, when you do the average, well, the diagonal part survives, so the wormhole remains. However, everything that is off diagonal gets killed by this average, and you're left just with the wormhole contribution. And so you have a factorization problem, but actually it's not a problem because since you've averaged over coupling, the factorization puzzle is not a problem anymore. Okay, so in some cases you might be able to do that, uh, but generally speaking, this is how you should think about it. And then the open question I think is to understand, okay, if that's the correct picture, what I'm advocating here is, well, how is factorization restored in some top-down theory like n equals to four super Yang mills? What are these strings, brains, or half wormholes that I'm talking about? And, can we compute them directly uh, from gravity? And one may wonder whether it'll be, ever be possible to compute this barcode spectrum directly in gravity. Uh, the, the second question is, um, you know, can we make precise, say we do want to do something like average, or we want to talk about what the dual of this low energy effective description is. Uh, can this, might, this has been called, I think, sometimes simple gravity or sort of imprecise ADS-CFT, but can we make it mathematically precise? Can we try to make precise what the CFT dual of um, semi-classical GR is? And I've argued today that the OP randomness hypothesis is going to be part of the story, um, but it would be nice to really make everything mathematically precise. After all, this is a, a mathematical conference. So let me thank you all very, very much for your attention. Thank you also for this very nice, uh, thank you for the nice uh, presentation. Uh, we have time for a few questions. From the audience first. Well, maybe I should start with a question. I mean, you, you said there was some non-Gaussianity in your, your uh, relations for your uh, OPE coefficients. D did that come from the uh, imposing the, the crossing symmetry, or did you have any other input that you put in there, I mean, in those relations? Yeah, thanks. So. Um, what I was saying is that you know non-Gaussianities are all, always present, even in the ETH. And in the ETH, they come from considering higher points. So basically, ETH is a statement about one and two point functions at finite temperature. But of course, you can always ask about higher point correlation functions. And consistency of these of these higher point connected correlation functions tells you that there's going to be non-Gaussianities. But this has nothing to do uh, then with crossing uh, relations. At, at this stage, this is general. This is just quantum mechanics. Yes. And then what we were able to do in CFTs is, is constrain the higher moments of these, these variables here using, in this case, higher genus modular invariance, and in this case here, crossing symmetry on the plane of uh, 2k plus two point functions, I think. Okay. Any other questions? No, if not, let's thank Alex again for a nice presentation. And then we go to the third presentation, and I hope uh, Davide is online, and I welcome him. Yep. Ah, here you are. Very good. So we're very pleased to have Davide Gaiotto also as our third speaker in this uh, session. Uh, he's also going to talk about something related to holography. Um, well, of course, he's well known on all kinds of original ideas and, and also in 
a connection with mathematical physics. And actually, this is a, a new kind of holography. It's called twisted holography. And uh, well, I'm curious to know what this uh, is going to be about. Anyway, go ahead, uh, Davide. OK, so I'm going to discuss uh, oh, sorry, uh, work done in collaboration with Kevin Costello and more recently my student, Kasia Buzic. Um, the, the two relevant papers are, are uh, linked here. And I refer you to those papers for the for the background references on the on the on the subject. So, what is twisted holography? Uh, it's a very precise toy model of holography. Uh, so, one of the main features is that it's uh, it's a toy. It's a in principle fully computable uh, toy model, which is mathematically well defined on both sides of the duality. It is a fully fledged example of holography. Uh, furthermore, uh, it is a protected subsector of the standard EDSFT. So there is a, if you want, there is a, a piece of the uh, ADS, ADS5 CFT4 correspondence which can be extracted and considered as, as studied uh, as its own object. And that's what, uh, what, what we call twisted holography. Um, it's exactly computable in the sense that on the quantum field theory side of the correspondence, uh, it only really involves uh, free field cal calculations, weak contraptions. Uh, it, all, the, all the interesting phenomena, all the interesting holographic structure comes just from the large N combinatorics. Uh, so in, in the standard examples of holography, you usually have a coupling, like the tube coupling, uh, and the gauge theory description is easy to study at weak coupling, while the uh, supergravity description becomes more relevant at strong coupling. And the big challenge is to interpolate between the two regimes. Uh, in, in these particular toy models, uh, the, the, cap, the, the dependence on the tooth coupling drops out, and as a consequence, uh, the sort of the, the, the You, you can directly com compare the two sides. The, there is, you know, you don't need to use uh, high power integrability techniques or, or other methods to interpolate in the coupling. The coupling dependence just drops out. The only parameter is N, is the, if you want the rank of the matrices which are, that appear on the gauge theory side. And uh, the, the main challenge is to, to study the large N behavior of correlation, these free field theory correlation functions, expand them in, in powers of one over n, and match with the perturbative calculation in the, on the supergravity side. Uh, I, I say supergravity, but it's actually uh, the, the gravity side involves the BCOV theory, uh, the B mod, B model topological strings. And I think another interesting feature of this twisted holography setup is that it provides a non-perturbative completion for the for, for the B model, at least in specific backgrounds. So right, I want to stress again, uh, this holography is in principle uh, fully mathematically manageable. Uh, the mathematical tools needed to study both sides of the correspondence are, are already present because, well, free field theory is quite mathematically uh, rigorous, and the B model topological string is also is also quite well defined. Uh, I mean. Costello and others have studied the BCOV theory, perturbation theory, at least in great detail. So, uh, what is the quantum field theory side? The quantum field theory side is, uh, involves a two dimensional quantum field theory, a chiral two dimensional quantum field theory, which means the correlation functions are uh, holomorphic functions or, the, or, the, or meromorphic functions, so the positions of the, of the operators. It is perhaps the simplest non-trivial chiral two-dimensional gauge theory with UN gauge group. So the matter fields are just two adjoint scalars, two n by n matrices of fields, of bosonic fields, with the simplest possible OPE. The, it's essentially a beta gamma system valued in n by n matrices. And when you study a two-dimensional gauge theory, um, after gauge fixing, all that is left of the gauge fields is some ghosts which also value, are valued in the joint and also have a very simple OPE. 
is DNC denote the ghosts. Uh, so the theory consists of these two bosonic fields or these two fermionic fields. And the crucial ingredients is the BRST charge, which is schematically uh, written as in this form. Uh, so in a sense, the BRST charge is the only nonlinear piece of the theory. All correlation functions are computed by weight contractions using this, uh, this free field of ease. The only subtleties that you need to employ in your correlation functions operators which are BRST closed with the confidence that operators which are BRST exact will drop out. Uh, so, right, so just to stress again, uh, the only place where you see interactions is at the, at the moment of writing down the basic operators. But once you've written them down, correlation functions are just done with free fields, uh, at least in genus zero. Uh, in, the, in, in today's discussion, I will focus just on correlation functions of this, of this theory on a true sphere. Uh, it is also possible to consider correlation functions on a torus or on a higher genus human surface. Uh, this has not been done much, uh, but it's definitely an interesting direction to go. Um, and in, to study those, one would need to do free field correlation functions followed by a finite dimensional integral over the space of, band, of UN bundles on the surface. And these we have not studied in detail. Um, so on the, what do we find on the gravitational side of the holographic duality? Uh, in the usual holographic correspondence, you're familiar, you should be familiar with the fact that the stress tensor on one side of the duality uh, matches the graviton on the other side of the duality. So in, in, the in this kind of theory, which is two-dimensional and entire, the stress tensor is quite constrained. Essentially, only one component of the stress tensor is interesting and dynamical, uh, the holomorphic holomorph, the what's called TZZ, the holomorphic part of the stress tensor. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, because we only have one of the con components of the stress tensor on the QFT side, uh, on the gravity side, only part of the metric is dynamical and interesting. So instead of finding a fully fledged theory of gravity, we find a partial theory of gravity where the uh, essentially only, only the fluctuations of the complex structure are dynamical. And now there is, there is such a theory of, of you know, complex structure of gravity. Uh, it's called Kodara Spencer theory. Uh, it's uh, the target space description of the B model topological strings, BCOB theory. And, uh, and so the, the actual conjecture is that this theory on the quantum theory, this theory might be dual to BCOB theory in some background. Now, in holography, we are uh, used to seeing the ground such as ADS5 times S5 or ADS5 at ADSK times some internal manifold. On the other hand, uh, BCOV theory, Kodara Spencer theory, is a theory of fluctuations of the complex structure of a Calabial manifold, usually a Calabial trifold. Uh, so we, here we need something which is both a Calabial and has the form ADS3 times something. And it just so happened that ADS3 times S3 uh, can be identified with SL2C, uh, with, a, with a complex SL2 uh, group, which is a three-dimensional manifold, complex manifold, and happens to be a Calabial. Indeed, it's what's called in the literature a deformed conical. Uh, so the zero statement is that this two-dimensional quantum field theory should be holographically dual to uh, BCOV theory on SL2C on the deformed conical. Now, in order to make this holographic duality uh, precise, it's very important to give the correct boundary conditions. And indeed, a good amount of the work we did in the paper with, uh, with Costello, the first one here, was about figuring out what are the proper boundary conditions. You know, uh, what boundary condition can you impose on the B model in such a way that Small fluctuations in the boundary modifications to the boundary conditions would look like uh, insertions of local operators in a two dimensional uh, quantum field theory. Uh, 
there is there is quite a quite a rich story here that I'm not going to describe in detail. These boundary conditions break some of the symmetries, some of the naive symmetries of the setup, uh, which are which should be broken in order to match the quantum field theory. Um, just to give an example, the quantum field theory has two SL2 symmetries. There is an SL2 asymmetry which rotates X and Y into each other. And there is also a, a global conformal symmetry when you work on a sphere, which is also SL2. Now, uh, these two symmetries are clearly very different. One acts on space time, the other rotates the fields into each other. On the holographic dual side, this becomes just the left and right SL2 action on SL2C. And so it's very important that the boundary conditions break the symmetry between left and right actions in order to match the quantum field theory. So there are three strategies that one can employ to uh, prove, to, to convince yourself that this uh, duality really, really occurs. Uh, the first strategy just follows the, uh, the example of uh, Maldacena's original paper. So you take a stack of D brains, your favorite theory, you back react, replace in flat space, you back react and take some kind of linear horizon or scaling limit, which uh, on the original side, decouples the, the volume theory of the brains from the, from the background, and on the dual side, uh, focus on, on a part of the back reactor geometry. And you can do the same. So the Maldacena's analysis of design type should be string theory. You could repeat the same trick in, uh, in the B model. You start from the B model in C3. You take a stack of ND2 brains. You back react. You take the coupling limit, and you write to our correspondence. A variation of this idea is to go back to ideas involving the geometric transition. So uh, the geometric transition describes situations where the, say, the B model uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a certain manifold with a stack of brains is supposed to be equivalent to the B model without the brains, but with a different geometry. So in particular, there was a conjecture that um, if you take, again, N issue brains wrapping a CP1 in the result conifold geometry. This should be the same as the B model on the, the form conifold. And uh, I expect that taking an appropriate decoupling limit here, one would also rec recover our proposal. Uh, finally, this particular Karal algebra, as I mentioned at the beginning, happens to be a, a subsector of, a, of, the, of an equal force superior mills. So there is a certain Karal algebra subsector uh, which actually exists for all for the n equal two theories, uh, which involves the, the cohomology of a certain superconformance charge. Um, and the Karal algebra subsector of n equal four supermills is this two dimensional theory. And so, if you use the standard holographic duality, you would predict that uh, this Karal algebra should be dual to some protected subsector of supergravity in EDS5 and S5. And although this has not been demonstrated, uh, explicitly, uh, it's our belief that the DB model on SL2C is a protected subsector of type 2B string theory in a DS5 and SS5. Actually, it would be, would be nice to, to verify this directly. Uh, it, it should be some variant of the original BCV idea that the B model uh, topological string describes type 2B string theory in a self dual gravity fault on the ground. The idea would be that somehow ADS3 and SS3 is uh, a localization fixed point in ADS5 and SS5, and the neighboring geometry is that of a gravity, gravity fault on the ground. Uh, anyway, uh, for due to the limitations of time, I will only discuss one particular aspect uh, of the. So we have done a variety of checks of this of this duality correspondence. Um, I want to describe one particular check that I, which is the one I did uh, with my student in the second paper uh, linked here. So uh, we, in this paper, we study the correlation functions of determinant operators in the quantum field theory. So 
The determinant operator is essentially just a determine an operator built as the determinant of one of the scalar fields. Uh, the pro prototypical de determinant operator will be just determinant of x. Uh, here we study a, a two parameter family of, of, the, of, of, the, of the formations of this, uh, of this expression. So we study the determinant of x plus a multiple of y plus a multiple of identity. Uh, so if you want, this is the determinant of x, where a certain number of x fields have been replaced by y's, and a certain number of x fields have been replaced by uh, the identity. At least that's what we would find if you were to expand in powers of v and m. Now, in the physical, uh, and it of course, super Mills theory, uh, determinant operators have been studied before and have been related to something called giant gravitons. Uh, essentially, the idea is that the insertion of the determinant in the quantum field theory has a peculiar effect on the holographic dual side. It instructs you that there should be a D-brain which is reaching the boundary at the corresponding point. So if I insert the determinant at some point on the boundary theory, in the, in the, uh, in the gravity theory, I should see a, a D-brain which arrive, goes at infinity with a very specific shape reaching the boundary at that point. Um, and so um, analogously, uh, I mean, just so there is a variety of situations where you can start from conjectural statements in the four super meals, and you can use this uh, idea that the theory is a product subsector in order to derive conjectural statements about the twist of the holography setup. Here, the statement is that this, the insertion of this operator in the Carroll theory should give you the, should instruct it that you should insert the endpoint of a D shoe brain uh, in, at the boundary of SL2C. Here with the two brain, I denote a D brain, which wraps a curve, a two dimensional real manifold, a one dimensional complex manifold, sub manifold of SL2C. So if I study a correlation of functions of say five determinant operators, I'm instructing the theory to, inst to have the endpoint, five different endpoints, which kind of look like a half cylinder, reaching the boundary of SL2C at five different points. Or at least, I mean, I call them point, I should say in five different directions. The holographic dictionary uh, tells you how the point in the, in the quantum field theory is matched to a direction in SL2C. At infinity in sl 2 c And the particular shape of the D2 brain uh, near the boundary, near infinity, is determined by these parameters V and M. So our objective, our objective is to study correlation functions of K determinants, each with their own position at the boundary and parameters V and M. So what does holography tell you about this problem? So holography, the, the holographic prescription for these determinant insertions is that you should find uh, deep brain saddles. You should find uh, configuration, you know, configurations of, of one or more of the two brains which satisfy the equations of motion of the B model and also reach the boundary in this particular way. So essentially, I, you need to find different ways to fill in this picture uh, with some uh, D2 brain. The equations of motion tell you that these two brains are polymorphic curves. So uh, this is a, so we kind of have, so the problem is that we're finding an holomorphic curve, which in SL2C, which has a specific shape at infinity. Once you find one or more such holomorphic curves, uh, each of these curves is going to give you a saddle for the problem, a semi-classical saddle for the problem. And the, the correlation function should, should look like a sum over these saddles of exponentials, or the exponential of the action of the, the two brain plus subleading corrections. So the, this correlation function determinant should look like a sum over saddles of, of expressions of the form e to the n times something 
with this something should depend on the shape of the Dishubrin in the bulk. Uh, and so this is a very clean example of geometry emerging from free field theory correlation functions just from the large n combinatorics. This correlation function uh, is in principle straightforward to compute. You just do weak contractions for these X and Y fields in this product of the terminants. After you do all the weak contractions, you should get something that can be written as a sum of exponentials. And the coefficient of these exponentials should match the action of these holomorphic curves in SL2C. Uh, it looks like, it looks rather miraculous. And we were actually quite surprised with it. I mean, not surprised, but it was very uh, nice to see that this actually works. So um, how do you do this with contractions of determinants? Uh, there is a standard strategy which has been developed uh, some time ago by Comats uh, and others, um, where uh, you subject the determinants to a sequence of transformations which make the problem more manageable. So the first step is to fermionize the determinants, meaning that you take this determinant of a n by n matrix and you write as a pattern as, as an integral over two n auxiliary fermions. Where the matrix plays the role of a kinetic term for the fermions. Uh, so this is just a finite dimensional integral. We are adding a you know uh, n psi and n chi for each of these determinant insertions. So we're adding about 2k n fermions. After you determinize the determinants, you have an expo a product of exponentials of, of, uh, of the fields, x and y. And this is easy to, to, to uh, and it is easy to take a correlation function of such coherent states. Uh, when you do all the contraction between the x and y fields, you end up with the integral of the fermionic degrees of freedom, which has quartic interactions. Then you do a Hubble Stratonovich uh, transformation where you introduce auxiliary k by k matrices in order to make these quartic interactions into Gaussians again. And finally, you integrate away the fermions and you're left with an integral over these auxiliary degrees of freedom. So we start with a three dimensional quantum field theory integral over n by n fields, matrices of fields. And we end up with an n by n finite k by k integral, the integral over k by k matrix rho. Uh, the diagonal components of rho are fixed to be equal to these parameters uh, mi. And the, uh, the action is very simple. It has a quadratic term, sort of sum of rho i, rho i j, rho j i, uh, which depends on the choice of b's and z's. So, which depends on the positions and orientation of these determinants. And there is an extra term that comes from integrated way the fermions, which is essentially the determinant of rho to the n, or if you, or, or, or can also be written as n times the trace of the logarithm of rho. So what's very nice is that after these manipulations, the n dependence has been made very transparent. We just have a k by k integral with an action which is proportional to n. And so taking the large n limit is straightforward. It's just a stubble point approximation uh, for this integral. Uh, so you can already see that the answer for this correlation function is going to be a sum over exponentials. But the exponentials now, the, the action for these exponentials is going to be the action for the subtles of this integral, the, the subtle point value of this action. Uh, the equations, the subtle equations that come out of this integral take a very nice form. Uh, let zeta and nu be diagonal matrices, where zeta has, again, has diagonal entries which are the zi's, and nu has diagonal entries which are the vi's. And then the subtle point equations for this action can be written as the commutator of zeta and rho plus the commutator of nu and rho inverse equal to zero. So they are strange looking equations and the prescription is to 
find solutions to these equations, plug them into this action, and then you'll find this sort of exp expansion. And in order to verify the duality correspondence, we must be able to pair up, to relate uh, solutions of these subtle equations with uh, holomorphic curves in SL2C. So this is what we did uh, in the paper. Uh, we almost did it completely. There is a gap that we haven't yet been able to address, but um, I, I hope somebody in the audience might know how to do so. Uh, it's, it's a very simple problem in large variety geometry. So we have, we're trying to study holomorphic curves in sl 2 c with specific boundary conditions and to match them with some uh, spectral data. It's like an ADHM sort of construction. So what we did with my student is that we found a way to build out to this row four commuting matrices uh, which satisfy the relation of SL2C. You know, something like, um, well, right, right, something like, so we, are, we build essentially a spectral problem, something like a lax a collection of lax matrices, uh, which when diagonalized, give you a spectral curve in SL2C. Uh, so for every row, for every subtle point of this matrix integral, we can find the curve in SL2C. Um, now, what's not completely obvious is that is to go back. So if we're given a, a holomorphic curve in SL2C, could we always find such a row? Now, it's not actually obvious that this should be the case. See, uh, one of the most interesting problems in quantum gravity, really, is to figure out which semi-classical subtles will contribute to a given integral, to a given quantity. Uh, I mean, uh, from the, even, even in the talks you've, you've heard until, until now, uh, one recurring problem is, you know, if I have a theory of quantum gravity, which subtles contribute? Uh, do I include all, all uh, you know, geometries with all sorts of topologies or not? Am I allowed to include geometries with two boundaries? What, what, what can I do in the theory of quantum gravity? And what I find really exciting about this sort of twisted holography setup is that here you can find precise answers to these questions, at least within this model. So, for example, it's not clear that all the D2 brains that I can fit in the supergravity in, in SL2C will contribute to the correlation function. Maybe uh, I, if I think about uh, <clears throat> this problem as a protected subsector of n equal four super meals, uh, at the very least, I would like deep, deep the two brains which can be lifted to giant gravitons in the full physical theory. And even then, I don't quite know which, which D brains will contribute to the for physical theory calculation. So a priori, it's not obvious that for all curves in SL2C, I should be able to find a subtle solution of the matrix model problem. And figuring out which curves can be associated to matrices might tell me information about which subtles contribute to the calculation in the supergravity side. So what we did is that for genus zero curves, we could find rows. So we found a way to compute to associate a row to each genus zero curve in SL2C. And we haven't uh, done the same for higher genus. And I would like, you know, it's, it's, it would be interesting to know if this is possible or not. Um, now, another thing we did is that we matched a variety of observables on the two sides. So given these holomorphic curves. So there's about five we, minutes still, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, perfect. We can compute the action. We can compute the one point function of closed strings in the presence of these brains. And all of this can be matched to the correlation functions of the quantum field theory side. Um, so, so this, this really seems to be a very nice example where just where the large n combinatorics of three fields manage to produce geometry. Um, I mean, it, it, it has been 
an underlying team in holography for a while. Gopakuma has been pushing it particularly hard, uh, you know, of asking, okay, we, we know that the strong coupling, the quantum field theory gives us gravity and ADS phi and SS phi, but what happens if we coupling or what happens if I turn off the coupling? Is there any geometry there or does the geometry mysteriously appear uh, as the coupling becomes stronger? So in this sort of toy models, you see that geometry is already kind of there in the, in the free field theory calculation, which I find fascinating. Now, what can you do from, me, from here? Uh, well, one obvious possibility is that there are, this twisted holography example is just one of a whole family. So here we had these adjoint scalars for UN. There is a whole family of theories, which is labeled by necklace quivers by sort of uh, uh, affine ADE diagrams um, and should be dual to SHC quotiented by some discrete groups, subgroups. Uh, a more interesting direction is to study operators which has size n squared. See, here we study determinants which are sort of built out of n fields. Um, it's also possible to study operators which are built of order n squared fields. Uh, this was done, for example, originally in LLM. Um, these operators really change the geometry. So they tell you, okay, you have a geometry which looks like SHC to see at the boundary, except the nearest collection of points, it really looks different. And then uh, the holographic prescription would be to find the Calabiao geometry, which can fill in the bulk with these boundary conditions. So studying this problem, one would really get to the point where you have uh, a sum over Calabia over geometric saddles over deep of geometries, over Calabia geometries, possibly different topology. And so you start getting closer to this problem of understanding which saddles contribute to a gravity path integral. A similar situation occurs if you study correlation functions in genus greater than zero. Uh, I should stress that genus one correlation functions also admit an embedding in equal four superior meals. So that would be quite, uh, you know, physically relevant question. And in genus greater than one, there is no obvious embedding in equal four superior meals, but it's still an interesting holographic problem. And again, I assume there will be some kind of a sum of a Calabiao geometries with a certain asymptotic shape, but I have no idea how that will look like at the end. Uh, finally, I think it would be interesting to study near protected sector. Meaning here we see that we can get geometry from these from free fields in this protected protected in this collection of protected collection functions. Next, you could study operators which are close to be protected, but uh, a little bit away from that. So for example, you know, change a single X into a, a different field of the physical theory. In these near protected sectors, often the large end combinatorics win over the coupling dependence, meaning that uh, although the correlation functions depend on the coupling, sometimes you can find uh, peculiar modifications of the perturbative expansion where you have reasonable control on both sides of the duality. And so this might be possible here. Okay, uh, this is all I wanted to say on the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Can I invite the audience for questions for Samson? Um, hi. Is this example of SL2C uh, one of those that we know the B model exact answer from the things like beta gauge correspondence or the, the work that Marino was doing? Uh, lots of uh, cases we know exact answers, Hello? right? So uh, the earliest you can go to is diagram Vafa. Yes, so, for example, yeah, yeah. So if you take these operators and you set V equal to Z, they become topological. So this is a chiral, this is a, you know, this, this is a quantum field theory which has a position dependence. This is a two-dimensional quantum field theory. But this, this, this has its own protected subsector. So some of the operators in this two-dimensional theory give you correlation functions which are just a, a zero-dimensional Right, but not not, not 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 the determinant correlators, but just but just the partition function, right? It's a BCOV 
uh, uh, things can be solved in many cases. I just don't remember if no, SL2C... Well, the partition function is a bit boring in this setup. Um, oh. You really need correlation functions to get something interesting. Oh. Unless you go to Hager genus. So definitely you could do... Oh, yeah, I meant, I meant all FGs. So, for example, can you, can you say what F0 is uh, uh, from... Uh, well, you know as what far the, as I know, the B model in the deformed conifold is a pretty boring uh, mm -hmm. F0. I mean, not completely boring. As I'm saying, you can compute it in the Dagger Fritz and stuff. You get, you know, you get the Gaussian, the Gaussian uh, matrix model. You get the. Yes, but the FGs you know, are higher genus FGs are, I mean, it's. No, not okay, not no. It, there is definitely something there, uh, but it's, it's just a, a collection of numbers. Uh, Okay. Yeah, you get correlation functions, which are functions of position. Uh, okay. Okay. So no, I mean definitely. So this should be compatible with the with the with the matrix model story. Actually, I, I, what I was asking was if you, if you see integrability, because in the case of in, in that case there, this uh, free field um, free field kind of uh, exp expansion, if you remember, also appears in this. Uh, uh, the Coulomb gas kind of picture, which which sums up, uh, you remember that, right? So w way you calculate the partition function on n equal to theory with uh, special omega backgrounds includes uh, some kind of Coulomb gas picture. Well, this is a this is the this is not the omega background. This is the uh, if you want to do a omega background, it's the one the Rastelli beam and all and all uh, protective subsector, the, the Carl algebra protective subsector. But they managed to relate it. They, they, there are some relations. A, 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 anyway, so you, you're right. The partition function is boring. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Now, the, if you go in Hager genus on the band, if you take the boundary to be Hager genus, there is something somewhat analogous to the Bloom gas in the sense that uh, if you try to do correlation functions of a two dimensional gauge theory in Hager genus, you need to include an integral over the modular space of bundles. Of UN bundles on the on the Riemann surface, um, okay. which you know has a flavor which is a little bit like a, like a Coulomb gas, but not quite the same. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, just a short question. Did you look at other observables than these determinants? I mean, like trace operators in this theory? Yeah, no. You, you looked at the so for the for the standard traces, uh, we. We, we in the paper with Kevin, we we showed that the problem has a at, at the leading end, leading order in end has a large symmetry algebra, which is a holomorphic vector field on, on the deformed conifold, and that is enough to fix the large n correlation functions of the, of the all the traces. Okay. Uh, and we didn't do the subleading in end. Uh, here also, I'm doing the leading in end uh, correlation function, but in the presence of the determinants. To go to sublinear order, you need to start doing some diagrams of Ferrer's massive theory, okay. which is interesting. And uh, but I, I, I don't have the skill at the moment. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, one more last question. Uh, hello, David. Uh, thank you very much mm -hmm. for the nice talk. Um, so I do see the point of this explicit construction that like you can control either of the two sides very well mathematically. My question is a very vague one, namely if based on this very specific example where one can control these two sides, say even a chance or like the slightest of an idea how to form, make actually like a uh, formulate a precise theory maybe in the context of the Costello-Williams framework or higher categorical framework, you actually someone yeah, can construct a precise mapping between these observables of these two theories. Yeah, absolutely. Like I mean, I, 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 I think this is a, you know, a ready-made setup where holography can be made mathematically precise. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, but so do you, do you see like specific, um, how to see, specific hints from this framework, how this could look like, for example, in the Costello-Williams fr framework? I, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean. So the, so, so the B model in onsl 2 c I assume is just, Defined. Uh, in the, I mean, it's it, it, the perturbation theory of Federer Spencer theory is 
they're fine, I think, on any Calabi hour. Mm. The, for SL2C, there is a bit of subtleties with the boundary conditions. So one has to make sure that the boundary conditions we give really give a good, uh, a good perturbation theory. Mm. Uh, but that should be doable. Mm. OK, yeah, thank you uh, very much. All right. And so all the matrix model side is just three correlation functions. So. Yeah, we, we have one question uh, online from Alex Berlin, actually. So can you speak up, Alex? Yeah, I hope you can hear me. And thanks for the nice talk, David. I also wanted to ask a question about higher genus. Mm -hmm. So can you compute the finite temperature partition function on the field theory side? Does it have a phase transition? I mean, does it have features that you would expect of a gravity dual, like a Hawking page phase transition? And so, uh, so you can compute it. Uh, I've been trying to study the modular properties. Um, I, I can compute the one over tau to one over tau transformation, but it's not quite, uh, it's not very simple. Um, so the, the point is that, the, you know, this theory is conformal blocks, but I don't know the psi. I don't, I don't know the, uh, I don't understand how these conformal blocks look like, especially in the large end limit. Uh, but Definitely, um, I mean, I definitely expect to have this, to have uh, uh, saddles, different saddles. So the, the, the sort of the vacuum conformal block, the vacuum model conformal block, the, the most naive uh, conformal block, presumably corresponds to literally taking uh, SH2C and quotienting by taking an SL2C with a banda, which is a cylinder, and, and quotienting it to make it into torus. Um, and this geometry is not invariant under tau goes to one over tau, so there must be multiple saddles. But I have not checked at which point you have a phase transition. So for example, I don't know if you if you already change saddles when tau is of order of uh, n or of order one or which power of n, it's all open. I see. So it, it it, it could be a bit more like the Schenker Yin story, where there is a phase transition, but the temperature scales with n in some way. Yes. Yeah, so I have no, I have no idea. I've, I've done some preliminary calculations, but the large end limit is is tricky. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, in view of the time, we're going to stop now. Let's thank uh, David again for this nice presentation. Thank you very much.